we will go ahead and get started. Um, we're so excited to have, this is our first shop chat of the year. We're very excited to have a great lineup coming. Um, and today is no, no different. I'm very, very excited. So before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items, and then I'd like to introduce our guest. Um, we love to have questions on shop chat, and we very much encourage you, if you have a question, maybe even just an observation or a, you know, me too kind of a story that you want to share. Those are all things that we'd love to hear. And so we'd encourage you to make a note in the chat and we can share those. I'll be interrupting here and there as, as needed to bring those to Jennifer's attention as she's moderating the conversation. Um, and also we will have a recording of today's session available on our website after today's time together. We'll be posting a summary blog, blog uh, with some of the key takeaways from today. Um, and all of that will be available soon. And we will send that out to anyone who registered today as well. So let's get started. I'm very excited today to share with you um, our guest, Tamara Winfrey Harris. Um, Tamara is a writer who really specializes in that space um, where current events, politics, and pop culture intersect with race and gender. Um, she's the author of two books, uh, that's very inspiring to me. I know I have a book inside of me that hasn't made you it. Do. Yet. <laughs> um, and those two books are the, the one is called The Sisters Are All Right, Changing the Broken Narrative of Black Women in America. And the second one is called Dear Black Girl, Letters from Your Sisters on Stepping into Your Power. Both of those are available. And um, Tamara's had lots of other published works as well in various media outlets, including the New York Times, The Atlantic, Cosmopolitan, New York Magazine, uh, the Los Angeles Times, and many, many others. And so that's very exciting. We know that she's also um, the, the co-founder of Centering Sisters LLC, which is an organization that is really addressing the needs of, is of issues uh, for black women and girls. Um, she's part of the Black Women's Writing Society, which is a, month, a monthly space uh, for Black creatives. Um, and last but not least, she recently took on the role of president of the Women's Fund of Central Indiana, which is where she has a direct connection with Borshoff's own Jennifer Deswaner, who's here with us. Um, and Jennifer is a partner here at Borshoff um, and current Women's Fund Advisory Board member. So Tamara, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'll turn things over to Jennifer now to start our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And um, I, somebody said that the chat is disabled. So I will just mention that to Catherine and she may, yep, get that fixed there. And um, Tamara and I will just be discussing and not worrying ourselves with IT issues since it's not either of our strength. But <laughs> Tamara, thank you so much for being here. I know... Um, Having just known you uh, a little bit over the years and a little bit more recently, so many people call you Tammy, but I'm just going to tell you how much I love the name Tamara. So I'm going to be super <laughs> formal with you and the world can call you Tammy, but I just love Tamara. <laughs> so, um, you, uh, Catherine just gave your amazing bio and I know um, as, yeah, as a women's fun board member, we were thrilled when you um, accepted the position because um, you're kind of a, a local hero, I think a heroine for a lot of us. So um, talk about, you went to Iowa State um, and uh, Cyclones or something like that, as I think you were. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, should, of course I should know that. <laughs> when, you, when you went there, um, why'd you study journalism? What were your hopes and ideas? Did, did you know that going into it as a, you know, a high school senior, whatever the case was, or did you figure that out when you were there? And, and what attracted you to journalism as so many of us in, in PR sort of end up with that kind of major? I always knew that I wanted that as my, I was a strange child. I, <laughs> I was very bookish, not strange, very right, right. and strange. But um, I was always drawn to writing. I mean, my parents always remind me that, you know, I used to make my, like, create my own magazines and books. And like, when I was a little kid, I always, my, I had an aunt who worked in journalism. I always knew that I wanted to write. 
And in my head at the time, that I mean, that's what you major in if you want to write. Um, so I always knew that I wanted to major in journalism. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do with it, but I always knew I wanted that to be my major. Awesome. Because one of my questions was going to be about the importance of representation or role models. And it sounds like an ant in that space was a very, was a defining piece for you. Because I um, can't think of a lot. I mean, I can't think of a lot of Black women who were in that space, like at the time, like I grew up in the 70s and 80s. I'm a Gen Xer and I can't think of a lot of them that were prominent now. There are many, but not at the time. Did you have Black women writers, authors who were important for you or maybe, I, yeah, some of your I don't, th- you know, and I was a huge reader, but the reality is like, I love that now in YA fiction and things, there are so many Black women writing, there's so many women of color writing. Um, but again, there weren't many other than the ones in my family. Like my mom loves to write and was an English teacher. And I found out I had a great grandmother who wrote wonderful poetry. But I, you know, I think like a lot of um, girls at the time, I was reading Judy Bloom and I was reading Nancy Drew and I was reading Little House on the Prairie, like all of those things. But again, there wasn't a lot that directly spoke to me in my experience understand you said you knew you wanted to write a book even when you were a child did you which I think is for a lot of people an aspiration and maybe some of those on on today's shop chat when did you actually know as an adult that you were going to actually fulfill that dream it probably wasn't until right before I did it so I was well and I was well into I was in my 40s I was like my early I was in my early 40s before I found that like, it was always the thing in the back of my head, but I didn't know what am I, what am I going to write about? Um, and I loved fiction, but that seemed more monumental to mm-hmm. write fiction. Um, I felt more comfortable in the nonfiction space. And it wasn't until, you know, right before I wrote the sisters are all right. What motivated me was some of the ridiculous conversations around black women in marriage at the time Um, There was all this conversation about why Black women are half as likely to marry as white women Um, or or marry later. But and of course, as it always does, when you talk about women in relationships, it came down to, well, something must be wrong with you if men aren't choosing you. Hmm. Like one of the things I point out in the book, like George Clooney can like sail through his 40s and not be married and it's awesome and he's a bachelor but when when women don't do that it must oh you're like the Jennifer Aniston effect oh how sad and lonely and broken you must be um and as I listened to the conversation there was this added layer of racism and misogynoir like added into it as people were talking about women and it drove me absolutely crazy So my first idea was a book about marriage. And when I found my publisher, they're like, this can be so much bigger. These stereotypes that you're talking about, like, don't they affect Black women and all of these other spheres? And I was like, they do. And I feel like I've been training all my writing life and writing in magazines and those things to talk about it. So it expanded. But um I was I was broken and motivated by the ridiculous sexist conversation that was going on at the time. That is awesome. And to put it into words so eloquently as you did is so impressive because I think a lot of us have a lot of things in our heads that need to make it onto paper and even as one who writes for a living, then to turn it into something long form is yeah, very impressive. Well, I have with me here as part of our, you know, infomercial that we are here, but this <laughs> fabulous book. And and to your second book, you did something different then. The first one was getting it out of your head and into a book with The Sisters Are All Right. With Dear Black Girl, you were asking friends and you asked people mm-hmm. around you. And I love that the story is that you asked, I think you wanted 50 letters to start or 12 letters and you got mm-hmm. 50 and then mm-hmm. now you have thousands. Um, In terms of, and and the subtext to that Dear Black Girl is letters from your sisters on stepping into your power. What have you heard about how the women felt, your friends who told their stories, 
as well as the girls who received those stories. What, what have you heard of that? Interestingly enough, so in the book, I asked women to write vulnerable and open letters about a variety of topics, identity, sex, beauty, advice, work, friendship for younger women and girls. Um, and do it in a way that we sometimes don't communicate with younger women because we don't want to be open. So it comes out sometimes as lecturing, like what you ought to be doing instead of saying, hey, you know, I'm concerned because I did that too. And here was my experience. So I heard from the women who wrote the letters, one, that it was very cathartic. Um, you know, some women said, I, I've never really written about that before. Um, I believe there was one woman who wrote about being incarcerated as a teenager. And she said, I've never really talked or written about that before because it felt shameful to me, even though she like she was a huge success. She's a radio host. She like huge success. She's like, I, it just felt shameful to me. So they said it was cathartic. And also as they were reading the letters of other women, you know, even if they weren't 21 or 15 or 16, they also said it was healing for them too, because it was an acknowledgement of some experiences and feelings that we all feel when we're younger and that we rarely acknowledge. And I think we all have a little unhealed girl somewhere in there that carries some of the stuff that you experienced or were insecure about, you know, when you were younger. It's so true. And also as professional women, I think we've always been taught to obviously be professional, whatever that means for, mm -hmm. you know, for you and your, in your setting. But I think for those of us of a certain age, it was definitely to take all those mistakes we made, learn from them, but keep them right inside. They're not something we're vulnerable. Shut up about them, right? Correct. <laughs> yeah. Why would we ever come out in a meeting and tell everybody about all the stupid <laughs> stuff we did? <laughs> and I think there's an extra layer for women of color and really any woman, because we know that making ourselves vulnerable, we're going to get judged more harshly. We may not get second chances. Like there's a reason, you know, I don't want people to think that women are just, you know, stingy with their affection and their knowledge. I mean, there's a reason that we create those barriers. And there's a reason that women of color specifically create those barriers. But when we create them between each other, then I think it does more harm to us as a collective than good. Amen. And those of us who love, um, either grew up on or have learned to love women, women conversations, mm -hmm. um, I think that's what's so beautiful about the book is you do feel like you're eavesdropping on a really important conversation, um, you know, and, and hoping to learn from it, feel moved by it. I mean, there's no doubt I was, you know, crying through parts of them, um, but a lot of them are just uh, very uplifting and very inspirational as well. Thank you. Yeah, there are several that I read. <clears throat> you know, the first one that I got, the first letter I got, and I actually got it through email. It wasn't like a written and mailed letter. And it was by, you know, the woman who writes about <clears throat> having a difficult um, childhood, having parents that had HIV. There was some drug addiction. Um, she dropped out of high school. But at the time she was writing the letter, she was on her way to receiving her doctorate um, and was doing all this amazing stuff. And she wrote so beautifully about, you know, she says something about, you know, I will keep the light on for you and I will pave a way for you so that you don't have to experience the things that I did. And, you know, know that there are women and with us, you are home. And I was like, <laughs> I remember getting it. I was actually in my office at work and I was like, someone's going to come in here and wonder why I'm ugly crying. <laughs> but it was so beautiful. Well, that is, that is. And I think what we've learned too, and I know through Women's Fund and, and through your work with Central Indiana Community Foundation as well, is that some people find it, as you said, cathartic. Mm -hmm. And there's a point in our lives when we may find something cathartic, but other people to tell their stories is re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of that, that we've really learned in philanthropy or that we, I should say, we are still in the process of learning of when is it voyeuristic to, 
you know, walk through a women's shelter and sort of observe these people mm -hmm. um, in this. <laughs> And, and I think some of the letters could feel, you know, if, if people hadn't submitted these letters on their own, mm -hmm. it could feel like, you know, as you said, for some people, this was the first time they told this story. They were now ready yeah. um, and they may, you know, shared it with you and then you would share it with others. They still may not be talking to their family and friends about it. Yeah. And then for other people who we've seen go up on stages and tell their story, there is yep. such a spectrum of experience there. And as you said, for women of color, it's just one more added layer of, am I going to make myself this vulnerable? Well, part of it is about consent. You know, it's like, am I telling my story because I want to, you know, as opposed to me just peering into your life. Um, and the second is that, you know, I think Dear Black Girl is a wonderful book for, anyone who loves Black girls. I think it's for anyone who was a girl, whether you're Black or not. I think it's wonderful for all women, whether you're Black or not. But I wrote it for Black women and girls. And there's something, I had a, a great conversation with a friend of mine, Disha Filia, an award-winning writer. She's fantastic. And we talked about writing where the only gaze is our own. Mm. You know, very often, um, when you're asked to write, because the publishing field tends to be, you know, very white, and people ask you, you know, to explain, you know, explain things like, what's that language? What does that mean? Can you explain? And that immediately tips me off when I'm reading something that this isn't, you're not writing this for me. And so I wanted to create a space. I wanted the book so that girls would know, Black women and girls would know, I am writing this for you. You are centered in a way that you aren't usually centered in discussions about women or Black people, but everyone is always well, like everyone is welcome, but you are centered. And I think that creates a safer space where people can feel comfortable to share their stories. So true. Muriel, who's a colleague, asked what your favorite part was of writing the book. Ooh. Honestly, it was for Dear Black Girl, it was receiving letters from other women and reading them because every time, you know, there were some that came during that first, you know, request that I made, but then there were some that I specifically requested because I wanted, you know, girls to be able to see themselves in kind of the spectrum, all the ways they show up in the world. So it was important to talk to trans women and, you know, women who had been adopted and, we, you know, women who were professional, like, you know, all of those things. Um, and every time I got a letter in, I was shocked by just how open and vulnerable women were willing. I was like, wow, she, she said that. Okay. Like that, that was surprising and beautiful to me. Well, it's, it's such a tribute to you, too, to trust you with that and to know that you're going to know how to put it together and put it out in the world um, in this way, which, by the way, I think everyone should read this book, uh, women, men, and yes, people of all races, colors, creeds is just amazing. Um, and it, uh, in the humanizing sense of that, too, mm -hmm. and and knowing um, that one reason we wanted to have you is because you are a professional communicator, mm -hmm. um, which is what a lot of people on this on this call are. And you've taken it to a whole nother level by being an author there. But um, you also have this great resume with lots of different positions and titles. You are one of those, I'm sure, when you speak to student groups that you can say, just be open to the next move because you just never know what it's <laughs> what it might be. Um, but what role would you say that communications has played in all of these different hats that you've worn and roles that you've played? I really think that communications is the heart of everything, and which is why I always tell people marketing people can do anything um, because we can. I mean, because when you think of so much that you do, you know, how do you persuade you know, how do you share information? You know, if you want to change your community, if you start with organizing, how do you organize if you're not a good communicator? How do you um, change culture if you're not a good communicator? You know, the, our jobs include writing every day. So knowing how to communicate, knowing how to adapt your message to a target, knowing how to 
um, relay information in a way that is understandable, like all of those things, I think, are at the root of almost any business that you can, you know, that you can possibly do. And so I think having those skills as we do in communication sets us up to make a lot of transitions. And what role do you think? Oh, sorry. Do you want to go ahead? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to actually ask a question. And then I have another question from, from someone in the audience as well. But Tamara, I'm just curious, kind of on that same note, in terms of becoming a good communicator so that you can really affect change in your community, what do you think is the first step for someone who says, well, I'm not a good public speaker. I hear this from my clients all the time. I'm not a good public speaker, but I tell them it's so much more than that. There's so much more to being a good communicator. And I'm just curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on how you think people can get there. I think, you know, start by talking about what, speaking about what you know, um, you know, I am least, I am least comfortable when someone asks me to come in and speak about something. I'm always like, ah. <laughs> you know, if it's an area that I know like this, I can talk forever and I can be comfortable and I don't really need notes. So that's a great place to start if you're uncomfortable speaking in general, um, practice, 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 practice. Um, I actually used to teach um, speech communications 100 at University of uh, Indianapolis. And that was one of the big things. If you stand in front of an audience and you're just reading off of a paper, it's not gonna come across as genuine. So the more opportunities you have to speak in front of people and the more you practice before you speak in front of people, um, you know, you'll feel more comfortable. And I think also just be genuine and be you um, and bring your personality to whatever that you're you're talking about, which can be hard to do because we think we are supposed to sit and grip the podium and be professional, but people will respond to you better if you bring a little bit of yourself. Yeah, that's great. I think that's so true. And so it really speaks to that personalization. Whenever you can personalize and you can tell stories, that's going mm -hmm. to make all of the difference. So, so speaking of stories, one of the questions that we have is what story, as you were writing the book, um, uh, Dear Black Girl, you were collecting all of the letters, what story uh, really stood out to you the most, the one that really inspired you? Ooh. So there would, so I have two answers. One was that first letter that I said I got because it was just so loving. So I think if anyone reads it, you know, the, the writer's name is Nicole. She just models so well how to be loving to other women and girls. So I love that. And then, you know, it's hard. They're, they're, all the letters are like my babies. It's hard to choose a favorite, but I really love the chapter on family. You know, I grew up in a traditional family, but so many young women and girls do not, you know, they have divorced parents, they have parents who are never married, they're raised by grandparents, and sometimes those families get denigrated and they should not. And the point of that chapter is anyone who holds you and holds you down is your family and it is valid. And the ways that women wrote about, there's one letter that was written by my friend Rochelle Riley, where she talks about being raised by her grandparents because her mother um, was ill. Um, and it was just so beautiful. Like at the end, her grandfather buys her a car so she can get to her internship when she's in journalism school. And again, by the time I'm, I swear the whole book is not about crying, but, <laughs> but. The love that she had for her grandparents and the sacrifices that they made to create that family. I think you end that understanding why it's important that we validate all families and all families are important. Thank you so much for that. And another great question we got that seems to build on that is someone is asking, how can we create a safe place for women to embrace all aspects of self? and to share their experiences to inspire others. You ask and some people showed up and some people just showed up whom you didn't even ask, but how can we, yeah, as a greater community, create that safe place too? I think starting by creating women's spaces where we can feel comfortable with each other 
And then I think then as women, one, we have to see other women as free and able to live their lives in the way that they want to. You know, sometimes there are a lot of, um, you know, we have a lot of judgment placed on us, all women, very much women of color, very much women who live in poverty, you know, women who are trans, women who are like, there are a lot of, of all, all of these, you know, judgments placed on us, then you add sexism to the mix. And it's very easy to start shrinking yourself in order to survive. And then we look at other women and girls and we expect them to shrink themselves. So, you know, the woman in the workplace who doesn't dress like you think she should or doesn't respond in meetings like you think she should or doesn't live her life in the way that you think you, you, she should. You know, you can only love your sisters to the, to the level that you love yourself. So I think part of, you know, us making safe spaces for women is one, one creating spaces for women learning to love ourselves, and then learning to give our sisters that same grace, grace and breath and freedom. So beautifully said. And it relates so much to our work with Women's Fund and the hat that you are wearing there now. Um, and as a board and with you as president, um, what are some of the stories that you think girls need to hear, especially girls of color, and I will expand that to say women, um, mm -hmm. as you said, that we're all kind of uh, girls and women rolled into one, even as we mature to much older ages, those formative years obviously are formative for a reason. Mm -hmm. What are some of the stories that you think that we need to share more, hear more, um, and perhaps that the girls are not hearing enough today? I say, and we kind of touched on this a little earlier. I mean, they need to hear all the stories. Women need to be talking to younger women and girls, but especially about our mistakes. And those tend to be the things that we don't like to talk about because I think it's common for any marginalized group that, you know, we want to go, yay, women, women are empowered. Look at, you know, look at me. <laughs> I'm the, you know, I'm, I'm the president of an organization, but we don't want to talk about how you got there and the mistakes you made and the difficult things and the barriers you, you know, met, we just want to celebrate at the end. But that tends to make young women and girls, you know, when they hit a challenge, when they feel um, insecure, when they don't think they can do it, they kind of think they're alone and they're screwing up. And so I think we need to talk more vulnerably about our mistakes and our challenges, even as we celebrate at the end when we get to where we want to get and how we made it through. That's important too. Right. Yeah. I know you're familiar with this new CDC study that showed that three of five teen girls felt persistently sad or hopeless, which was um, mm -hmm. in some ways, I think as you and I were discussing, could be true of you know teen girls in every generation, but this was the highest rate in a decade mm -hmm. that they had seen. And that 30% said they've actually seriously considered suicide, which was a nearly 60% increase over the past 10 years. How do you think we as communicators, when we know our audiences may not be in a good place, because that affects everyone. I mean, that's a, that's a stat about teen girls, but those teen girls have friends and family and people around them who all um, are feeling that or contributing to it. How do we how do we communicate when everything feels a bit heavy um, and a lot of things that I could just go on from the news just this morning, but when everything feels a little heavy or a lot heavy, how, how do you feel like that changes our communications with audiences? I think it's important to acknowledge the heaviness even if that's not part of what you're communicating because you have to because you know if that if you're speaking to a target you have to acknowledge where they are so i think you know you have to recognize it i mean that's number 1 um validate it you know acknowledge it in what you're doing before you go on to talk about you know other other things yeah. And I think from the perspective of women talking to communicating with other women, 
you know, it goes back again, being honest about our own struggles, mental health struggles, whether they are small or large, so that we can communicate honestly about it. And then I think also letting go of prejudices, because one thing that I have learned that for Black girls, um, very often um, their mental health depression is not identified because it's read as anger and hostility. And so, you know, I have a very good friend who's a psychologist, and she said that Black girls usually come to her through systems because people ignore their depression and issues until there's an outburst and then they're suspended. And then they're, you know, they're sent through a system somehow, and then they finally get help. And social media being so much the blessing and the curse that it is, uh, right? I mean, every time you even say the words, I think that's the reaction too. Is just like, oh my gosh. And and if girls have been crying out for help in a social media context, but then people dismiss it. Or because so much of social media can sound like a cry for help, we can't appropriately decipher or we don't always even have visibility into that. Um, and yet I am also struck daily by, uh, you know, I hesitate to even say it, but somewhat the blessing that social media is too. I think I've gotten to see, and I know a lot of my um, women friends and friends of color, I've gotten different insights into them because of things that they posted that we might not have shared um, being in a meeting or even out to dinner together. Um, so I think that that's an interesting piece of when you, I, I know more and more of that CDC study as they delve into it, it really does feel connected to social media and wondered what you think as communicators as we know we can use it and need to use it, but it's affecting people in really profound ways. I th- yes, I mean, I think social media is a blessing and a curse. I've heard from, you know, a lot of young women and girls that they were able to find their people online. You know, you think about you live in a small town or even in just an area where there aren't a lot of people who share your your interests and identity and stuff. And you can find that online. So that's great stuff. You can learn like you can learn more. It, it's open more of the world to you. But then you know, there's a lot and a lot of it comes back to marketing and average comes back to us um, that is designed to make women and girls feel like there is something wrong with them. Because if you are perfect, you don't need to maybe buy this thing, <laughs> you know, like there has to be something wrong with your eyebrows before I can convince you <laughs> that you need to buy this eyebrow makeup, you know? So I think I think we need to be cognizant of that. And I think it's a challenge to us to think about how, you know, those of us who still work in marketing and PR and those things, how do we serve our clients without also contributing to the problems that advertising can sometimes create? Absolutely. And how do we tell real stories in a very cynical world um, when people Mm -hmm. think that everything true is fake and every video could be a deep fake and every um, it is such a challenging time right now to when there's such a push for authenticity and at the same time a huge doubt I mean everything we everything you push out there people it, it hits a wall sometimes of people not believing you, I really think media literacy needs to be mandatory in school at different levels. Um, it, it really needs to be because I think we've lost that. And I think those of us who are parents need to start working with, I think it's, it's another, I know it's another thing you have to worry about teaching your children, but it's so important you know, I, you know, I find a lot of young people that don't understand the difference between, say, the New York Times and some random website, you know, we're, we're very cynical. And as a result, you know, it almost seems like we're in some a post-factual <laughs> society. 
Please don't say it. Please say it's not true. I know we use the um, the Ad Fontes uh, visual that comes out every year where they rank media across the left mm-hmm. to right and the credibility. And and it really is interesting and it is helpful um, to kind of know where some of those sit in in the best way. But and then um, people respond to be to that by saying that's what they want you to think. <laughs> they want you to think <laughs> that the Washington Post is reputable. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. So again, cynicism. Um, a question um, in the chat is that what tips do you have for engaging and supporting young women in a way that nurtures them? In other words, and what can we do that is actually helpful? and not patronizing. Listen, I think what was so interesting is when um, I actually sat down and tried to embed in places where young women and girls were and just listen to them talk. Because very often we go into conversations with younger women and girls where I'm going to impart my knowledge to you. So sit here while I tell you what you need to do without listening to what their feelings and experiences are. And frankly, they're very different. I mean, there are certainly ways that they are the same, but there are like tons of ways that their experiences are different. And social media is just what, like, oh my gosh, thank goodness there was not social media in 1985, (laughs) you know? I'm a sister, oh my goodness. (laughs) So I think in order to do that, we have to listen Um, because, you know, girls know when you're just, you know, when you're not listening and you're just responding and telling them what you plan to say all along. I think we're finding that across the spectrum in uh, women's fund overall too, is so much more of listening to the people who are doing the helping um, rather than coming in as, um, you know, philanthropists always with the best of intentions um, but kind of uh, across the board, sweeping in and saying, you know, here's a program we know works, go do this, or here's funding um, that we uh, believe you have. But instead of telling, listening and finding out where are those, where are those organizations? And I think that's been a growth over time. And I'm sure much, much to be learned there. Um, but as you're saying, and, and girls and girls of color are definitely the audiences that probably get the least listened to in some ways. I mean, they get dismissed as, oh, that's just them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are there ways in which our local community can engage to help preempt young girls showing up for mental health through systems better late than never, I suppose. This is uh, directly from the chat. I'm reading this and thank Mm -hmm. you for submitting this question. Um, This observation that black girls depression is showing up via anger and outbursts is so poignant. Mm -hmm. And and to be honest, and I just wanna be clear, it's not that black girls are showing up as hostile and angry, it's that's how people read it. So I think it's important for us all to know what our biases are about all girls and young women so that we can check ourselves. And when we see behavior that we're not seeing it through the lens of a bias. So, and I think we've talked about some of the things we need to listen. Um, We need to make sure we're not looking at girls through a biased lens. And we need to challenge when we see something happening where girls are, treated inequitably or unfairly. Um, you know, there have been a lot, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, school rules, school um, like dress codes that unfairly treat girls and especially unfairly treat, again, black girls. Um, so we need to be mindful of those things and stand up for those girls in those moments so that they know that they can trust us. Um, And another thing about Black girls to specifically look at, there was a study that Georgetown University did a few years ago about the adultification of girls. And it showed that adults across class and race believe that girls, especially between five and I believe 11, were more adult and grown up than other girls, um, were knowledgeable about adult topics, including sex and needed net less support. And so that is a lens that people view girls. So you can see how if Mm. you start showing some behaviors of you're not feeling great, 
in high school or middle school, how then that might be read differently. So we need to be aware of those biases so they don't creep into the systems that impact girls and black girls specifically. And uh, a colleague, uh, Bill, asked a great question of, in addition to modeling the behavior, what do you say to male and or white allies who ask what they can do to help bring about more gender and race equality? So I, I love this question because I had this opportunity in 2016 um, for New York Magazine to interview a bunch of people who were just allies to different groups, including men who were allies to women. And one of the first things they told me is educate yourself. So make sure you are reading information about like patriarchy, how sexism works, um, reading things in the voices of women, make sure you're re reading women writers so you understand their experiences. And it's you know, it's incumbent upon you to educate yourself, not like ask your wife. So what's the problem with women right now? <laughs> right now, Because people often do that. You know, they're like, let me go get the person who's affected to educate me. Um, that, you know, they also said it was important in addition to educating yourself to listen. So listen to women, listen when they talk and understand that we're kind of, um, society kind of nurtures you not to listen and believe women. Um, you know, there's a tendency to think when women are talking about their own experiences that they somehow must be biased, you know? So le learn, learn to listen um, and also figure out what you're willing to lose by being a better ally to women. Um, two of the men that I talked to that said they were allies to women said, that sometimes they felt uncomfortable in they they had lost some of the fraternity with groups of other men because they said I'm the one who's going to stand up and push back on that sexist joke. I'm going to you know I'm going to be the one that says no that's not okay. And that's uncomfortable sometimes. So it's important to know that when you're really an ally and you're pushing back on you know policies and processes and jokes and things like that, that, you know, it can be isolating sometimes. So true. And right. Finding those places where um, you can really make a difference with those comments too. Um, and be, you almost have to be prepared for them. I mean, in the moment, it's not our, our first reaction might be to be silent. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you said, it's almost like the practicing the public speaking. We have right. to practice our allyship, I think sometimes too, and say, okay, when that comes up again, I'm going to be ready this time. I'm going well, to- one one of the things they said was like, if you consider yourself an ally to any group, you have to do it from your seat. Like not everybody is going to be out, you know, marching in the street. Like not everyone has the or, or the wherewithal or the personality to do that. So if you're going to be an ally, you have to do something. If you're an ally, it's not just, hey, I have warm and fuzzy feelings about women. You have to do something. So you start from the areas where you can make change. And sometimes that's with your friends, if you're in a position of power in the workplace, is it in your neighborhood? So those are the places where you have to start and you have to get used to being uncomfortable in those places, which is hard. So true. And I think, you know, obviously whole conversations on intersexu intersexuing, um, mm -hmm. intersexuality of a lot of these things and, mm -hmm. and where um, a lot of yeah, these different things come into play with different audiences. And our friend Crystal was asking about, she was saying, thank you for bringing the conversation about adultification of Black girls forward. Has there been any work that demonstrates if and how girls of various sexual orientations experience adultification or that intersectionality? I, I honestly don't know, but you're, that would be really interesting. Yeah, and I and and as I was saying, because there's more intersectionality conversations where people, mm -hmm. um, and I think we're all uh, on journeys of this, or a lot of people mm -hmm. of learning um, more and more about it. I will, yeah, not politicize this right now with a lot of that's going on in the state legislature about how we talk about a lot of these different uh, different issues. But I think um, the the learning 
the growth and then where we can step in as communicators feels like a very important piece of this. I would imagine to Crystal's question, you know, another part, one of the other stereotypes that influence girls and women and women, black girls and women is the stereotype of hypersexuality, um, which makes us very vulnerable. 60% of black young women will experience some form of sexual assault by the age of 18. Um, and I would, I mean, that makes all women, no matter what their sexuality is, more vulnerable. And I have heard some Black women who are lesbian say, I, you know, I'm completely erased from the discussion, you know, because hypersexuality, you know, the people's assumption is hypersexuality straight. And so no one talks about my existence and my sexuality, but I am still as vulnerable in some of the same ways, but my actual sexuality isn't discussed. Mm -hmm. And there are some groups around Indianapolis that are working more and more on having some good conversations around that and helping and finding safe spaces mm -hmm. for people to, to learn and to grow, which is so helpful. Um, a word that you, you, you have a group centering sisters um, uh, we, uh, right now are, uh, that word centering has been very helpful for me in my journey of anti-racist journey, um, in terms of how much we center whiteness as a country, as a community and as individuals, when we've been brought up that the other is somebody who mm -hmm. is now white or othering, uh, people with that. And I wondered if you could, um, just talk briefly about Centering Sisters in terms of, I think you had that name before a lot of us were using it um, <laughs> and, and what that meant to you. Cause I think it's a really, for me, it's been a really helpful word and I would hope it'd be you know helpful for others about what we center uh, when we center it. So, you know, Centering Sisters came up. I was working with two dear friends of mine, Dr. Carolyn Strong, who's an educator and Dr. Tiffany Monfort Dent, who's a psychologist. Um, and it was actually a workshop with the two of them here in Indianapolis where I did, where I was asking for letters. It was an intergenerational uh, workshop uh, for women and girls. And we just wanted to create something so that, as I said, we could center the experiences of Black women and girls because so often when we talk about women, we talk about white women and when we talk about Black people, we talk about Black men and you know, black women and girls lose the opportunity to have their experiences centered. So, you know, while we were all in lockdown, we did some um, just um, sort of Zoom circles for women to just say, black women to just say, "How are you doing?" And you know, come together. Let's have a healing circle. Let's talk about what's going on. We have done some workshops most recently. Um, last year for Spirit in Place, we had a wonderful panel discussion at the Walker um, with a panel of women just talking about their experiences. Um, and so it's it has be really been our way of uplifting the voices and experiences of Black women and girls and helping us heal and helping us be great. That is awesome. Thank you. And um, for those of us who aren't, I think it's so helpful to take a take time and just see it through a different lens, you know, look through, look through that lens and, and centering sisters important for everyone. So thank you for, for all you do with that. My final question for you is knowing that you had such inspiration um, in your book and when you had everyone write these great letters and, and it feels like the kind of book you could republish every six months. I mean, it just, you know, more letters, more thoughts, more, and as the world keeps changing and vocabulary keeps changing. Uh -huh. and, and all of these things, who in your personal or professional life, who keeps you going and inspired? What or who, who is it who inspires you? I have an awesome sister circle of amazing women who just like, they, they are, they, they are absolutely awesome. And they inspire me because they do like, they achieve amazing things but also they are there in my moments of achievement and my moments of yuck. <laughs> yeah. 
they give great advice. Um, they make me laugh and they mix great drinks. And who, who, who needs more than that? <laughs> One of the best things about social media is memes. You could just send people that need no other words around them, but just. They are the meme queens. <laughs> <laughs> You are awesome. And I especially love you might be one of our first chop chats with a floating balloon, you know, in the background, which I just love. Yes. <laughs> what is the story there? This is, this is strange. It is employee appreciation week. And so we came into, you know, we work from home on Mondays usually. So we came in on t- today, there are all these balloons around the office and in our offices. And yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, Tamara, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a really fun conversation. And we do have some questions that we didn't have time to get to, but I'll send those to you. Maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, insight into those questions, and then we can add those to our blog. We will also have a replay of today's conversation available, uh, and we'll have all of that posted on our website. And I'm very happy to say that our next shop chat is actually scheduled for March 30th. We'll be talking with a good friend of mine. His name is Scott Baradell, and he is an author as well and has recently published a book called Trust Signals. And it's all about really the new um, direction of, of public relations and marketing and how we really have to build more trust with our audiences. And that's really the bottom line. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. Um, again, thank you so much, uh, Tamara. This has just been so fun. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Happy Women's History Month Eve. Yes. I to say, as we go from Black History Month into Women's History yeah. Month, you were the per- perfect February 28th <laughs> guest. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining us today.